Hey movie junkies, welcome back to Twin Flix where we are always celebrating the art of cinema with you. And we had the pleasure to finally sit down and chat with renowned writer, creator, producer, and director, this guy who wears many hats, Kenneth Johnson. And he created, wrote, and directed the groundbreaking 80s miniseries, V. He dives deep into about how he was affected by his parents' bigotry and his childhood and that how that was the roots behind the premises of V. Before that, he created the 70s hit TV shows, The Bionic Woman, and of course, The Incredible Hulk with Lou Ferrigno, and later directed the sequel to Short Circuit. So this was a really special interview for us where he talks a lot about his path into filmmaking, writing, and how, as I said, his environment when he was younger reflects a lot of his projects. It was a very timely interview, especially in what, where we are at today in, in 2020. So grab yourself a cold one or a snack, kick back, and enjoy our conversation with Kenneth Johnson. Can you hear me okay? I can. Okay, great. Looks like we're good. Is this Paul or is this Simon? Uh, Simon. Yeah, we're we're twins, hence the name Twin Flicks. Are you really, are yeah. you really twin twins? Oh yeah, identical twins. Yeah. Wow. Which is actually very rare. Wow, how cool. Yeah. So it's was, it was pretty fun growing up. Always had someone to do something with. <laughs> right. First, uh, you want to tell, uh, tell us uh, where you come from, where you hail from. I was born in the same town my parents were born in, both of them, Pine Bluff, Arkansas, Arkansas. which is uh, in the deep south. It's about 45 minutes south of uh, uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, and um, uh, I, was, uh, I was there in, uh, I was born in 1942, getting further and further away, <laughs> um, and uh, so it was in the middle of the war. My father was uh, uh, working at the Pine Bluff Arsenal, which he helped to build down there. Uh, during World War II. It was the largest stateside arsenal during World War II. And, uh, and then about uh, when I was about four, just before the end of the war, we moved to uh, Arlington, Virginia, outside of Washington, because my father was transferred to uh, the general, uh, general's staff uh, in the Pentagon. So we had to go to Washington. And, um, um, and the, uh, uh, after the war, my mother and father, it was not a marriage made in heaven. Uh, and uh, they ended up uh, separating and divorced. And uh, I stayed in, in Washington, uh, outside of uh, ultimately Maryland, outside of Washington, where I grew up. And, uh, but my dad went back to Little Rock. And, uh, uh, and every summer, I'd go down there to uh, visit him and all of my relatives and aunts and uncles and cousins and, and grandparents down there. Uh, so I really got to see two sides of the country, you know, because yeah. uh, Pine Bluff and Little Rock are very different from Washington, D.C., oh, yeah. um, uh, as you can, uh, you can imagine. The, yeah. um, uh, I still have strong memories of being very small, about five or six years old, and being in a bus station, and I didn't understand why there were three restrooms, mm. uh, you know, and there was men, there was women, and then there was colored. Yeah. And, uh, and I remember as a kid, uh, one day I, I saw a water fountain that had a little sign over it that said colored. Mm -hmm. and, and I went up to it with very eagerly and turned it on because I wanted to see what color the water was. And uh, my, one of my strongest memories, though, is when I, in Washington, where I grew up, I'd be on the bus uh, with my mother or someone there. And I always went to the back of the bus because I loved the big window in the back. You could see the world. You know, it was cool. And I remember being with my grandmother in Pine Bluff, and we got on a bus on Main Street in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. And I did like I always did. I ran to the back of the bus. And everybody on the bus, white and black alike, went, mm -hmm. And I heard my grandmother saying, Kenny, Kenny, you got you to come back up here. And I said, no, I want to sit in the back. I like the big window. Yeah. She said, no, you can't sit back there. You have to come up here. And I was really frustrated and angry and thinking back, I really felt discriminated against mm. <laughs> because I couldn't sit in the back of the bus, you know, where all of the, of course, the black people were. Yeah. Um, and, uh, 
Uh, and that stuff uh, stuck with me through my, uh, through my childhood and my adolescence, uh, Simon. Uh, uh, my mother was uh, uh, very bigoted, mm. also very anti-Semitic. Um, she had married a, a uh, remarried to a, a uh, Yankee from uh, Massachusetts who was actually even a bigger bigot than she was and oh, incredibly wow. virulently anti-Semitic. And so every night when I was a kid at the dinner table, I would hear all of these hate words and all of this hate talk. And, and for some reason, it just never stuck. Mm -hmm. I was an only child, so I didn't have anybody to talk to about it, you know, uh, but it, um, uh, it, shaped me in a way that I hadn't really realized because uh, as I got older and into my adolescence, I had friends who I discovered were Jewish. I had no idea and it didn't make any difference, you know, yeah. and black, black friends the same way. Uh, and, uh, but my, uh, uh, my parents were really like that and they weren't not intelligent people. Um, they, were, they were not not intelligent. And my father living in Arkansas, my father graduated Phi Beta Kappa from uh, Mississippi State University as an electrical engineer. Engineer. He was brilliant. The only person I ever met in my life who had a better memory than my father was Richard Nixon. Because mm. Nixon could get off, could meet you once and get off a plane and 10 years later and run into you and go, Simon, how are you? How did your mother still have the double hiccups? And you know, she he had it. And my dad was like that, and he was brilliant, but he also was absolutely convinced that the black mentality was inferior to that of the white man. Why is that? Well, because they have rabbit blood. What are you talking about? He said, well, they have that sickle cell anemia. You don't see that with white people. Their blood's no good. You know, and I was like, oh, my God. And I mean, this is a brilliant guy, you know, uh, but he was raised on a plantation. And uh, uh, he used to tell me how he'd, he'd hunt bullfrogs with the, with the black kids and, and uh, play baseball with them. I said, well, why didn't you go to school with them? Well, Kenny, you don't understand. You know, so what I took from that, though, Simon, was uh, as I got older, I realized this was something that I did not like mm -hmm. and, and, and mm -hmm. attitudes that I did not want to embrace. Beyond that, I wanted to do what I could to sort of fight back and chip away at, against those kind of attitudes. Um, and in, in so many ways, it uh, has affected so many of the, the works that I have done in my career uh, where I was able to, uh, you know, hold it up to the light and uh, let it get sanitized a little bit. Yeah, I was uh, going to say that you can see that in your work. You can see, uh, you know, even Incredible Hulk, of course, V, the similarities of the Nazi regime. You can right. definitely see see how that affected you in your work. And, yeah, um, and it's interesting because one of my favorite songs is the one that uh, Oscar Hammerstein won a, a Pulitzer Prize for when he wrote it into South Pacific which is the, you've got to be taught, you know, before it's too late, before you are six or seven or eight, to yeah. hate all the people your relatives hate, you've got to be carefully taught, you know? And um, uh, there's great side stories about that. You know that uh, there was, uh, they, would, they would take South Pacific on tour, and when it went into the South, there were some cities that said, you can't do that song on the show. And Oscar Hammerstein and Richard Rogers said, then you don't get South Pacific in your town, because yeah. we won't play you. And bless their hearts, uh, it was, um, you know, so it's, it's something that always has stuck with me, as you say. Yeah, it's, it, it's just, you know, you look back through history, and that was the mentality that, that uh, like, your parents grew up with. It was very drenched in, in racism. And it's just well, so sad. Really not like today. And not like yeah. today. Uh, yeah. You know, it's all different today. Oh, my God. It's, uh, it's, it's amazing uh, what's going on in the world right now and, uh, and how it's been unleashed in the last uh, three or four years. Yeah. Um, and it's, uh, uh, you can't let it happen. I, you know, B, of course, as you know, I'm sure, was based on a, a novel that I read by Sinclair Lewis that he wrote in 1935. It can't happen here about mm -hmm. Nazi, like, the rise of fascism happening in America like it happened in Italy and Germany. But it can't happen here. We're America. <laughs> well, it can. It's what. Yeah, and We're you know, ho hopefully the situation will be taken care of. You know, I mean, to see the protests and, and the riots and stuff, it's, it's heartbreaking with George Floyd and everything that's happening and stuff. And you see the neo Nazis trying to raise their power and stuff. It's so heartbreaking. It makes you want to cry. And 
it's just too bad that people aren't like you as a child. You never let that envelop you. You never let that uh, be your mentality of racism right. and anti-Semitic. It's too bad people can't be like that as they grow older. And yeah, well, that's you know, what we have to just keep fighting for and, and pushing in that direction. Yeah, and, and it's it's great to see those in the entertainment industry and and quite a few in political industry fighting against that. And, <laughs> you know, as Sus Susie, my wife, was telling me the other day, she heard uh, uh, George Clooney had said something about what was going on in Louisville and some some right wing wag said, well, what does he know about it? He's a Hollywood movie star. And he got online and said, you know what? I was born in Louisville, Kentucky. Yeah. I was raised in Louisville, Kentucky. I cut cut tobacco leaves in Louisville, Kentucky. Don't tell me I don't know anything about Louisville. You know, and it's it's great to have people realize, oh, right, that can happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we moved. Um, we lived in Portland, Oregon, and Vancouver, Washington, back and forth growing up. And um, mm -hmm. then we moved to California, and now we're here in Texas. We've been here in Texas for close to 20 years now. Um, wow. we, we worked in the film industry for quite a while doing independent things here and there. Mm -hmm. And uh, getting to know some of these celebrities, it's, it's sad to say that sometimes you do meet ones that are bad apples. But then when you meet those that are great, like George Clooney, I mean, some of the nicest people in Hollywood, and they're really trying to help. Yeah, most of the... Right, I've been I've been very lucky and uh, to have been able to be involved with so many people that are like that, and and there are so many of my the people in my industry whom I admire so much who have taken it upon themselves to, uh, you know, to fight back, and yeah. so we'll just we'll just keep it up. Yeah, it's great. So now we want to let's uh, get to how you got into the the field that you're in. How'd you get into the business, the show business? Well, I, oh, it's funny. I want to mention to you that, mm -hmm. that I uh, uh, had looked on your site and I saw the uh, interview that you did with Polly Morgan. Yeah. And it was, it came at a fortuitous moment because I had been, uh, she is on my sort of short list for uh, being a cinematographer on V the movie, if it gets going, uh, mm -hmm. because I hadn't, I wasn't, I didn't know who she was. Uh, and I had been impressed by the cinematography in Quiet Place. Uh, that uh, the uh, the Danish woman, I believe, had done that. Mm -hmm. uh, but now on, on Quiet Place 2, Polly Morgan. Who is Polly Morgan? That's a great face, you know. And uh, so I was, I had been looking at that time, at that moment, for some more information about Polly, and boom, there was your interview. And I'm was, glad we uh, could help with that. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> she, I appreciate it. I'll give you, she, I'll give you a credit. She was wonderful. She was great to talk to. There was yeah. a few stuff that we didn't include in her interview. Did mm -hmm. it in you know, editing and stuff. Right. She's such a great personality and um, very, very knowledgeable about her, mm -hmm. job, her work. Very yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it was, it was, it was terrific. But uh, yeah. I, I, um, uh, I bought a tape recorder when I was in the eighth grade um, and, uh, uh, and started playing with a tape recorder, a real old reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. Um, mm -hmm. Weighed about 7,000 pounds and was the size of a suitcase, you know. Yeah. Uh, and... Uh, and uh, came across a script, a script that had been written by Howard Koch um, in uh, 1938, I guess, for uh, Orson Welles. Uh, and it was the radio play that Orson Welles did of War, War of the Worlds. And, uh, and I said, wow, this would be so cool to, to do our own radio. I got a tape recorder and I got all my ninth, eighth, ninth grade friends together in my living room. And we did our own version of it with all hitting them, all the music and the sound effects and everything. It was a, it was a hoot uh, and very, very elementary, you know. Yeah. But, uh, uh, and as I look back, and of course, I, I saved the Orson Welles role for myself, you know. <laughs> and, um, uh, and I... Uh, uh, it, it was it was really fun to do, and I wouldn't I didn't realize it until much later when I looked back and I said I was really a producer early on, <laughs> you know, because uh, there I was with the idea. I didn't write the script, but I found it, and uh, and I knew how to direct the actors a little bit so that we could do it, and uh, uh, and I put it together, and 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 when it was done, I took it to the to the my junior high. And uh, my English teacher wanted me to play it for the class, which we did. It was like almost an hour long, and it was it was the, the whole play. Uh, and uh, and and they she loved it, and talked to the other teachers about it. And pretty soon, I was playing it for a half a dozen of the different classes uh, in my uh, junior senior high school. Uh, and so what happens at that moment is you get known as the drama guy. 
Yeah. <laughs> you know, and uh, and so I was that. Uh, and I was also known as the guy that carried a briefcase, but you know, uh, I still get teased about that by my wife and all of my children, but uh, I was ahead of the game. It was whenever all the other kids were carrying around piles of books, I had it in a nice, neat little briefcase, you know? It wasn't a backpack, but hey. So, uh, so I was the kid to carry the briefcase, but I was also the kid that was the drama guy. And, um, and when I was in the 10th grade, they asked me if I, they were doing a, a Christmas carol for the Christmas show that year. Uh, and asked, they asked me if I'd play Scrooge in a Christmas carol. And I said, sure. Uh, and I started, uh, we started rehearsing it. And it was a, sort of the standard version of a Christmas carol that you'd do in a high school, see in a high school. And at the end of it, it just sort of, just sort of ended. And it didn't have any bounce at the end. You know? yeah. And I came across an old recording, I think that Noel Coward had done of, uh, of A Christmas Carol. And at the end of it, he put together this little soliloquy where he sort of put it all together. And um, uh, and it was really cool. And I went to my drama teacher and said, "Hey, uh, could I do this little piece at the end? I just sort of step out in front of the, crowd, the, the curtain and do this little summation." Yeah. She said, "Oh, that'd be great." So I said, "Okay, I'll do that." And I'm thinking, it needs a little music, <laughs> you know. So you see what's happening, right? <laughs> and so I went to the the, uh, the the head of the choral department because the uh, our big chorus, sixty voice chorus, was going to be singing there. And I said. What music are you? Is there a piece of your music that you're doing that we could, I could have under when I start this? And she said, Well, we're doing this and this. I said, Oh, well, how about this? Oh, holy night! I said, um, At the end, I'll come out, and as, as soon as the curtain closes and I start to come out, you start to go. Don't sing the words. Just sing do 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 right. And I said, And I will do my little speech, and then you all start singing the voice, the words uh, right here. Okay, I could read music. I had a few years of piano before I discovered that as a pianist, I was a great drummer. Uh, and uh, so that's what we did. So we did the play and I'm in my old age makeup, my Scrooge stuff. And, uh, and I come out, uh, come out and they're, they're going do, 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 do. And I go, well, that was a Christmas for you. And I can tell you that Tiny Tim did not die. He's alive, <clears throat> growing stronger day by day, a fine boy. Now, when I'm in an elevator nowadays at Christmas and Oh Holy Night starts playing in the elevator, I start doing my pitch, <laughs> you know? And I can still time it out so that just as I finish, and as Tiny Tim said, God bless us, everyone, this 60 voice chorus came full voice saying, fall on your knees, oh, here. It was like electrifying, you know? And I went backstage and I remember leaning against the wall and my little heart was going pity pat. And I thought, oh my God, I have found my home. I have to be in the theater. And, cool. um, and, and that's where it came from. It started there and then I had to sit lead in my junior play and my senior play and uh, then went to the, the Department of Drama at Carnegie Tech, it's now Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, renowned drama department, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, met a lot of friends that became friends for life, and uh, the die was cast. That's that's a great story. That's <laughs> that's true. Uh, Paul and I we, we kind of did the similar thing when before we uh, stole my dad's uh, hi eight cam camcorder, <laughs> um, not steal it to pawn it, but steal it to make movies. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'm glad you didn't we, pawn it. Uh, <laughs> we would always use you know tape recorder and make skits and different stuff and right. like we would do like our own Star Trek shows and and all this stuff. So yeah, I can definitely relate to where you're coming from. We would always incorporate old music and sound effects and do the exact same thing. It was sure. so much well, that's fun. Great. And nowadays, kids nowadays, nowadays, kids can make movies, you know, yeah. for a dollar and a quarter with your cell phone. It's uh, it's amazing. I get little fan videos from all over the world of uh, people in in South America, and Germany, and France, and Italy, and Spain, who have uh, who have they're showing me their latest uh, version of in costumes and with props, and it's like, uh, you know, either, and, and I also, of course, a lot of young people, not so young now, a lot of uh, folks will tell me how during the days of the bionic shows, they'd be running around in the playground pretending to run in slow motion, you know, and all of that stuff. And it's a, it's a delight to, uh, to hear that they still try to do stuff like that based on some of the stuff I did. Yeah, it, it's, it's great to see how technology has gone so far. And, you know, I remember when it first started, it was such poor quality. And now it's great quality with the iPhones and, yeah. and Android systems. I mean, it's, no. it's yeah. not as great as a, actual film camera but still it's very very good it's clean and it sounds no, great it's very very good and there it's funny in, in the in my miniseries v there were a few visual effects shots that cost 
75, eighty thousand dollars for like six seconds of film, and and you could do it on your cell phone today for nothing, and it would look better than what I did back then with the guys that were at the top of their game in the state of the art at that time. Yeah, well, uh, but um, we were limited. Yeah, well, you know, back in the early '80s, you could do or do what you only had to do if you weren't a weren't a actual feature film. But I, I wanted <laughs> right. to talk about V. Did you conceive that as a miniseries at first, or did you try to get it made as a feature? Well, um, uh, I I read the, the novel Sinclair Lewis's novel, like It Can't Happen Here, and I thought, wow, it would be really interesting to do a piece about a a sea change in our life. Um, and I mean, at that time in 1982, there had not been a sea change in our life really since Pearl Harbor had been attacked, you know. Um, and uh, I mean, now in recent memory, you know, we've had at least two more sea changes like that, 9-11, of course, and now the, uh, the pandemic that we're in the middle of. Um, and, but I, I wanted to explore how ordinary people would react to extraordinary circumstances and spurred on by the idea of, uh, uh, of a right, a very far right wing fascist uh, uprising, started starting as a, as a grassroots situation, which is the way that it worked in It Can't Happen Here in, in Lewis's novel, uh, and then grew like Topsy until it was uh, out of control. And suddenly we weren't in the same country anymore. Yeah. And I conceived it as a feature film. I wrote it originally as a feature film. Um, and I was in the middle of writing it when I was having dinner with my friend Brandon Tartikoff, who was then in, head of in, president of NBC. And he asked me what I was doing, and I mentioned this, and he said, oh, I want to read it. And I said, no, no, Brandon, this is this gonna be, it's a big movie, man. And I, you know, I don't want to tell it about it. Because my, my focus in my life, Simon, had always been motion pictures, not television. I sort of got into TV because uh, that's where I could get into. Um, and um, uh, and it was a great place to, to get in. and, and uh, uh, and I learned a lot in television, but my focus, but everything that I've done in TV, I've always tried to have a feature mentality about doing it. I remember as, as a director in, in, when I would first start directing TV projects, people would say, I want to remember, it's close up, close up, close up, it's a TV, close up medium. And I said, no, I, I see uh, old Hitchcock movies like North by Northwest on even on a little screen like this. They look pretty good, you know, <laughs> and you can do a wide shot if you know what you're doing and you're facing, you know. And um, so my my desire had been uh, to 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 try to to try to move into movies. So anyway, but Brandon really wanted to read it, so I let him read it, and he thought it was he just came unglued, and he said, "The idea of America under occupation is a fantastic premise. Let's do it, but I'm not sure uh, that Americans will understand fascism." Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know, it's not a complicated concept, Brandon. You shave your head, you put on a black shirt, and you beat somebody up. And uh, he said, no, but couldn't it be an outside force like the Chinese or maybe the Soviets in 82? And I just didn't believe that could happen. And uh, Jeff Sagansky, who was Brandon's uh, senior vice president, young guy out of Harvard, said, how about aliens, Kenny? And I went, oh, God, and no, I, I don't want to do that because... I, I, I was trained in the classic theater at Carnegie uh, from Shakespeare and Strindberg and, uh, you know, and all the classic writers um, over the ages and the Greeks and all. And, you know, I wanted to have a more eclectic in the career. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, um, but I, I realized that, uh, you know, and then, then I created The Bionic Woman. Uh, you know, uh, and uh, uh, and out of that came, uh, after that, The Incredible Hulk. And pretty soon, when you do a couple of things that are successful in one particular genre, then that's what they want you to do for the rest of your life, you know? And I was really fearful of having having been the uh, the kid who carried a briefcase and the drama guy. Now I was becoming the sci-fi guy, mm -hmm. which was not at all what I'd intended. I, I always enjoyed science fiction as a kid, uh, and but it was not... I wanted it to be able to do uh, work on a larger canvas than that with other things and do musicals and do comedies and all that sort of thing. Yeah, back then um, sci-fi was kind of looked down on. Oh. Well, there was there was there was a bit a bit of that and uh, and and still is by the way in many ways sometimes. But uh, uh, but I, I, you know so when when Jeff said aliens, I said oh god I know I don't know that. But um, uh, Brendan said well just just think about it just think about it. And I went home that night and I thought about it and I thought it's a really a brilliant idea because I can still tell the exact same story that I want to tell. 
and yet have all the razzle dazzle and the eye candy of the visual effects and big spaceships and you know that kind of thing. Uh, but still mm, tell the story that I wanted to tell, which was not about spaceships and alien races and lizard people and all, but about power, because V was really about power, about how, like when the Nazis rolled into across Europe, there were people who would suck up to that power and collaborate uh, for their own aggrandizement um, or safety. There were other people that would say, well, if I just keep my head down, don't bother them, maybe they won't bother me. If I'm not Jewish or I'm not uh, a scientist, as in the case of the uh, of V, um, and then there were the people that said, no, 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 this is, this is not right. This, uh, this power is being abused and we have to fight back against it. And they become, of course, the heroes of the resistance. And, uh, um, and that's what I, uh, what I set out to do. Uh, and it was, uh, fortunately, everybody got on board <laughs> and uh, we did it in an incredibly short amount of time and uh, incredibly short. Um, but it, uh, it came together in a real lightning in a bottle kind of way and uh, in a way that I am still very, very proud of. Yeah. Um, and it made people think, you know, that was, that was what I enjoyed the most is always is making people think, stimulating that thought process. Yeah, you know, it definitely influenced Paul and I. We were, uh, you know, even at a young age, we were maybe five or six when it, when it uh, premiered. Mm -hmm. Even at such a young age, we were so enthralled. I can still remember the first time, though, the open images and and um, um, having Brian Singer with a camera and the war going on, and then how they uh, Mark Mark Singer. Brian's the director. Brian Singer. I'm sorry. <laughs> Mark Singer is his uh, uncle, I believe. Right. Yeah, but Brian, Brian Singer did have a camera all the way, so you know. That's fine. <laughs> Mark no, Singer. Well, you're you're right. I mean, I wanted to do something. As long as I was doing it, I wanted it to take everybody's head off as much as it possibly could given the time and the money we had to work with, which was very little, you know, overall, although it was the most expensive miniseries per hour that had ever been made to that point. But we didn't have enough time. We didn't have enough money. Brandon was desperate to get something on the air right away because NBC was literally in the toilet and needed some, uh, something to, uh, that, that he really felt could uh, make a big splash and get some big ratings. So, and, so and he was came out at the perfect time because you had Star Wars in 77, you had Superman in 78, Alien in 79, then you had Empire Strikes Back and E.T. and The Return of the Jedi came out in 83, which I believe was the same year that V was premiered. Yeah, it was, so, 80, yeah, it was it premiered in, 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 uh, in May of 83, yeah. Yeah, so you had all these science fiction movies coming out and then you have a, you know, you, you have a miniseries, sci-fi miniseries coming out and you're thinking, oh wow, this is going to be really good. This is awesome. Yeah. And, um, and uh, it, was, it was interesting for a lot of reasons, too, because it, it's, I think, still to this day, the only big miniseries yeah. that had no movie stars in it. Mm -hmm. It didn't even have really any television stars in it. Mark Singer had a little notoriety out of Beastmaster, but not that much. But, uh, and I asked Brandon about that when we were casting. I said, are you sure this movie's going to open? <laughs> you know? And he said, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And they... Uh, uh, part of the reason it was it was so successful was the advertising campaign that uh, um, uh, Brandon had hired a guy named Steve Somer to be head of advertising and promotion for NBC. I had I had many run-ins with Steve when he was head of advertising at CBS and kept doing the wrong thing for the Incredible Hulk. He kept focusing on Lou instead of on Bixby, and uh, it just made Bill crazy, and which of course in turn made me crazy. Sure. Uh, and then Brandon said, I heard this great new guy. <laughs> and I heard it was Steve Summer. And, oh, my God. Because well, he hated it. I went into his office and I said, all right, Steve, look, you don't like me because you think I meddle in what you do. I have trouble with you because a lot of times I don't think you really zero in on the thing that is the most essential about what I've created here. I said, well, let me just throw out an idea to you. I said, do you ever see the Nazi propaganda posters? Uh, you know, the German uh, soldiers with the bear marks, the little uh, but Dutch girls on their shoulders. Hi, we're the Nazis, the new guys in town, you know. Uh, and, uh, and I said, let's, t let's, in my research, I kept coming across Nazi propaganda posters like that, where the resistance had gone out and just painted a big V for victory over the poster. And I said, what I'd suggest is that like three weeks before the miniseries airs, go out and put up just propaganda posters. Don't say anything about the show or the network or anything, just propaganda. 
um, and on billboards, on bus stops, on subway, you know, subway, all that. Uh, I said, then, uh, two weeks before the show airs, send out a crew of kids in each town, won't cost you hardly anything, and have them deface your own poster. You know, have them graffiti a big V over your own poster. And then on the last week, just put a little banner in the corner that says the battle begins on NBC uh, May Sunday to May the 1st, you know. And bless Steve's heart, he came out of his chair. He said, that's brilliant. We got to do that. It's going to cost a fortune, but I'm going to get it. And he did. <laughs> and, and it was that that ad campaign plus the the on air that we did a countdown only 21 days until yeah. they arrive yeah. you know and then the reviews started coming in from all the major reviewers in the country and the reviews were, were just stunning from the new york times to the uh, uh, to the la la uh, la times to the san francisco chronicle the philadelphia inquirer the boston globe i mean they were like you couldn't write this stuff it was so good um, and then they would fold those quotes into the, the uh, on-air promos. So everybody tuned in. And then the, the, the most satisfying thing was nobody tuned out. <laughs> you know, normally when you're doing a particularly a two-hour piece, the curve goes up and up. And then the last half hour it begins to level off and maybe start down. B just kept going up and up and up and up and all the way. And, uh, and because, the, because we delivered, you know, because the performances yeah. that my actors had, uh, had given were just uniformly excellent all the way across. There wasn't a false moment or a weak performance in the lot. And, uh, and what we had to say was important in the story. Uh, and the visuals, squeaky though they were for me even then, uh, still was not like anything anybody had seen on TV before. Yeah, that, that's uh, one point I wanted to bring up, is that a lot of the stuff that you guys did for mm -hmm. a TV show, which you don't, when, back then especially, you didn't think of a TV show as a money that, that we're going to bring in a lot of money and do all these great and special effects and have great music and acting, you know, it's, it's cheap, it's cheesy. But right. what you guys did was on a low budget movie scale, the special effects, even like you said, they were pretty iffy. They still looked good. They still, it's, it was still pulled off. Getting well, yeah, Joe Harnell to do the music was what? great. Yeah. And you know, the, everything, like you said, everything about it, it, it was phenomenal. You were oh, saying? Thanks, I appreciate it. Yeah, it, and it, it, all, it, all, uh, it, it all came together. It was, uh, uh, and I was working with a lot of the same crew uh, and, and visual effects crew, particularly that Stephen and George had been working with. Um, and, uh, uh, but one of the things about, you know, when you're doing Star Wars and you've got ships flying against a black star field, you can get away with a lot more than you can when you got it flying in the real world and you, it's, the light is affecting it. And, you know, and it's, it's was, was uh, remarkable what those folks, uh, my team was, was able to do given the time and the money we had, which was not enough. Uh, but it was, um, it was, you know, it's still something that I'm, I'm very proud of to this day. And we're still involved in right now in trying to put together a V the movie, which would be a remake of my original four hour miniseries. Yeah, I was not, gonna a ask. Reimagine, not a reimagining, but a remake, a real faithful remake, clearly brought up into the 21st century, yeah. clearly you know, living in, in this day and age. Um, but at the same time, mining all of the essence of what made the original such a hit, it's, it's I think anybody that uh, attempts to make a remake, even when it's the original creator, there's a real danger in messing it up, you know, by, by trying to in, reinvent the wheel and fix things that aren't broken, you know. So what I've done in the, in the, the, the movie script is to, uh, to keep all the things that worked. Uh, and the stories and the characters and the plot lines, and they've been refined and they've been changed and they've evolved in, in many cases, but still the essence of it is still the same. And the idea is that it would be the first of a, a trilogy of movies. Uh, uh, the two subsequent pictures would be drawn from my novel, it can't, <laughs> you can't have it here, no. My novel, V, The Second Generation, which picks up the story 20 years later, and we see what's become of the world and how it's not so bad on the surface. <laughs> it's a little like <laughs> North Korea, you know? Uh, but, um, uh, and it's, uh, so there's a, there's a real enthusiasm for trying to get it made. And we've had it set up three times now, uh, a big time uh, about a year and a half ago when uh, 
uh, this guy who a big pharmaceutical billionaire had bought the rights to Desilu Studios, the old Desilu Studios, mm -hmm. um, and just the name, <laughs> not the studio. There were no studio there anymore. But yeah, but they have a you know there that's the that's where Star Trek premiered. You know, of course, and uh, on Desilu and the Untouchables and a lot of big shows came out of Desilu back in those days. Anyway, he bought the name and uh, and he he uh, invited us in. He said, "Look, I'd like V the movie trilogy to be our big flagship production, and um, and here's some money uh, to as a uh, option money, which we began immediately to uh, get into doing uh, visual effects, pre visualizations, location scouting, all that sort of stuff, because uh, he was serious, going to do it, and uh, and we were about." three months in and the, the continuing money hadn't come in yet and although it was supposed to come in any day now you know and then all of a sudden uh, one day the hollywood reporter did this big investigative report about the guy how the guy was a sham oh. and how his millions his billions had sort of dwindled away to nothing and it turned out even the money that he gave us uh, as our uh, option money for the to, for the project he borrowed from somebody else you know, fortunately it was non-refundable, so we didn't have to pay it back. But, uh, but and he, you know, so the thing just, and he had made big announcements in the trades and pictures and posters, and it was like, oh my God. Uh, so it was very frustrating. Imagine your heart sinking uh, at that and, moment. Uh, oh yes, well it wasn't the first time. This is, you know, it happens a lot in this town. Every, every writer, producer, director in this town uh, can tell you the same kind of horror stories of the, the projects that didn't quite happen that should have. Uh, and didn't for ridiculous reasons often, but uh, uh, but hey, you know what else am I going to do, Simon? It's this is this is I don't play golf, and you know my my grandmother once told me if you find a job you love, you'll never work. And I, I at first I thought, what is it? oh right, I get it because it won't be work; it'll be play, it'll be fun, and that's what it's like to me. I love uh, being on a set. I love uh, more than anything else directing. Writing is nice, but but. Uh, what I really love is being able to to have the physical contact, which is difficult nowadays, um, but, but uh, particularly right now. But um, uh, you know, corralling and executing the the script is to me the most exciting part, where you where you're working with your actors and your crew, and it's living and it's breathing and it's coming to life right in front of you. That's what I live for, and that's that's you know that's when you're really living the dream is when you're out there and things are happening. Yeah, yeah. There's nothing like it. Definitely nothing like it. Um, just, just wanted to let you know that we we had we owned V on beta, then we owned it on VHS, <laughs> then we owned oh it God. on a DVD when it finally came out, and then okay. now we have it on Blu-ray. <laughs> Blu-ray <laughs> finally right. came out on Blu-ray. So uh, for those of you who haven't seen V, check it out on Blu-ray. You'll you it, it's an amazing story. Yeah, they were good. The DVD and the Blu-ray are, are much better than the original was because when I dubbed the movie originally, it was only dubbed in mono yeah. because uh, in, Warner Brothers wouldn't get, let me have the money to dub it in stereo because they said, nobody's broadcasting in stereo. And I said, not right now, but in 20 minutes they will be. Exactly. Let me in on. So when we went back to do the, uh, the DVD, first the DVD and then in the, the Blu-ray, uh, I was able to go back and really remaster all the sound. And so the DVD and the Blu-ray sound is sensational. It just takes your head off. It, it really is. We were watching it. Uh, we watched it maybe five or six times since we've gotten it. <laughs> oh, so, my uh, God. We're just kind of getting life. I mean, come on, you know. <laughs> v is our life. <laughs> yeah, it's become mine, the two of uh, Lazily, I'll tell you. Yeah, but but yeah, it, what a, an amazing job you guys did on mastering it too. Really well done, and the commentary that you did. Um, I don't was it the same commentary as you it was did the on same the same commentary? Yeah. The other thing that was interesting was when they were going to do the DVD, they said, you know, we've been looking at it in Letterbox, and, and it looks really good. And I said, well, that's because we shot it in one eight five and protected it for television, because uh, my pilot of The Incredible Hulk. Uh, had been released in Europe as a theatrical feature. Uh, it became the top grossing movie in Europe in 1977 or something. I mean, really? <laughs> yes. And then the, the, the subsequent two hour uh, uh, that opened the second season, the, uh, the Married episodes that I wrote and directed with Marriott Hartley, she won the Emmy for Best Actress in a Drama Series that year for that production. It was released in Europe as 
the bride of the Incredible Hulk. Uh, and it also made a pot full of money for, uh, for Universal over there. But it was frustrating because it, it, we'd shot it in four by three. And uh, so I, I had a feeling that V might very well get a foreign theatrical release. So uh, John McPherson, my late great uh, cinematographer, and I, I said, let's shoot it in 185 so that if it does get a theatrical release, it'll look cool. Uh, and if it doesn't, uh, at least we know it's there. And then well, obviously when DVDs and Blu-rays came along, it was in the right aspect ratio and it looks sensational on a home screen. It really does. Yeah. Um, were, how involved were you with the uh, newer V? Was it uh, uh, the reboot of the one that came out a few years ago? Were Not you at all. Not at all. You just by name. Then? No. After I, uh, yeah, I, I, after I did the original four hours, uh, Warner's breached my contract in a rather nasty way, and I stepped away and uh, left the sequel, the, the six-hour sequel that I had supervised the writing of, took my name off of it. Uh, if you look at the credits of, of V: The Final Battle, you'll see the name Lillian Weezer. That's mm -hmm. my dog, or was at that time. Poor Lily, rest her soul. Um, and because it was just, it had just been uh, changed so much from what we had set out to do. Uh, and I had nothing to do with the 1985 series, I think there was, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, they, they turned it sort of into a soap or something. It was, uh, my friends who had done the sequel, uh, the, the, the final battle, all the people that worked on it told me, don't ever watch it. You'll be, you won't, you won't like what you see. And so I never did. Uh, and then one day I was actually channel surfing here in the office one day and I, I, I scene went up and I went, wait a minute, what is that? It was Jane Badler in, in, in the scene. And, and I recognized the scene and I realized what it was and I watched almost 30 seconds before I turned it off. And then I turned it off because I, I saw them make every mistake you could possibly make in 30 seconds and I knew that I, I, couldn't, I couldn't go there. But uh, I know it's still very popular and a lot of fans uh, you know, love it and all of that. But, uh, uh, it was just um, not something that I was happy with. And, and then when they decided they were going to have another stab at uh, trying to do it in 2008, um, and uh, the guy who, uh, uh, Jason, who had come up with the, the new concept for it was really eager to talk to me and I was delighted to talk to him, fine, and tell him, you know, he told me what he was gonna do and how it was gonna go. And, and I listened to the whole thing and I sort of found myself saying, well, that's, that's interesting and good luck. You know, and uh, um, and at that that time in 2008, the Bionic Woman was being remade also um, by uh, David Icke, who had done Battlestar Galactica, and is a very talented guy. Uh, obviously, I've never met him, but but uh, uh, but the new Bionic Woman was about to come on, and uh, and the tracking numbers that they do before a show airs, the tracking numbers had been phenomenal. Uh, I was with uh, Peter Roth, who's the head of Warner's uh, TV at the time, and he was he's saying, you can't believe it. It's going to be the biggest hit show in the history of Western civilization. I mean, it's humongous. They were even running trailers for it in the theaters, right? And I said, have you seen it, Peter? He said, no, 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 but it doesn't matter. It's going to be huge. I said, have you seen the pilot? He said, no. I said, I've seen the pilot, Peter. It doesn't work, and it's not going to work, and the audience won't buy it. He said, no, no, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. Okay, so, so it opens, and the first night it's on, huge tune-in, about 14, 15 million people, which nowadays is a really big number, right? Mm -hmm. um, and everybody's going, oh, look at that, bang, boom. Second week, hmm, 33%, I think, of the audience fell away. Third week, another <laughs> third fell away. And it's just because people said, oh, Bionic Woman, yeah, wow, I love that, I'm going to tune it in. And they tuned in, and then they, and I had said to Peter, it doesn't work, Peter, because there's no humanity, there's no humor, there's no heart. It's dark and ugly, and you don't have Lindsay Wagner. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and after it crashed and burned, and it was canceled like eight or nine weeks, um, I, 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 David Icke, I saw, did a couple of interviews, and man, he's a stand-up guy in my book, because he said, we blew it. We didn't understand what the show was about, it didn't have any humanity. It didn't have any humor. Didn't have any heart. It was like it was like I said, "Boy, you get it." And bless your heart for taking it on the chin and saying, saying, telling the truth. Which is very. Uh, and the same, yeah, and the same thing happened essentially when they remade, tried to remake V in two thousand nine. Big numbers for the first night or so, night, yeah, night, and then after that, they never got those numbers again, and they just kept slowly, slowly, slowly fading away. They even pulled it off the air for a few months and then put it back on. Re restaffed it 
with a, two, two new executive producers. And it was like, they were, it was a disaster. Yeah, you know, like you said, the, the, they were missing the qualities that the original had. They, missed, they, they were missing the humanity. They were missing the fun of it. Nowadays, you get remakes, and they're just dark and gross and violent, and and you don't. Yeah, it's oh, disappointing, and then it, because if the, if you miss the essence of what made it successful, um, then you, you can't just g grab a big title and make it happen. I remember back in probably in the early '80s, they tried to remake Casablanca yeah. as a TV series, you know, and it was like. What are you crazy? <laughs> you no, know, it's like um, I'm curious to see how uh, Stevens' uh, new West Side Story. Yeah, that's going to be really good. Uh, yeah, you know, I always thought the point of a remake is to remake something that wasn't good the first time around and make it better <laughs> and make it good. <laughs> right. Yeah. There's no reason to make yeah. a remake like when Gus Van Sant did Psycho. What was the point in that? There's no reason to make a remake of a movie that's or show that's that's already solid and no. good. No, it was it was very peculiar, very peculiar. Yeah. But uh, but I appreciate all your kind words about this stuff, and uh, uh, and on behalf of all the the, the people that I work with, the, the actors and the writers and the producers who were all so talented, and, and all came together to uh, uh, to to make my stuff look good. Uh, it was um, it was really you know, it's really a wonderful thing, and the people that I've been able to help step up and help into careers to a lot of people that, were, that worked with me. It was one of their first gigs, you know, and, uh, and I keep moving them up uh, from, from one uh, season to the next. If, uh, if they were proving their worth, then I would say, yeah, you did it now. Here, take the next title and the next pile of dough so that you can, you know, move on to your career that way. And that's a fun thing to be able to do, too. Yeah. Let's, let's rewind a little bit back to, you mentioned Incredible Hulk and Bionic Woman. Uh, how, did you pitch those originally, or how did how did you get involved with those two shows? Um, when I first came, I had been back. I'd been in New York uh, as a writer, as a producer, director, and television. No, not a writer, just a producer, director, and TV, and had a number of successful shows. I was working at WPIX in New York, one of the big local stations back there, and did some documentary kind of things. Did uh, uh, a number of shows that were good, and some hit musical shows, and that kind of thing. Uh, but I had really always been focused on film and wanted to get back into film. And when I first left college, I said, okay, I'm gonna go to New York. I knew a few people there. And I got to New York and they said, why did you come here to make movies? We're not making any, any movies in New York. <laughs> and I was like, oh, wrong place, wrong time. And I'm there with married with a kid. Uh, and it was like, oh, okay. So I just got drawn into TV and, uh, and I was there for a while and then went to, uh, uh, in 1966, uh, I was asked if I'd meet with this guy who was the executive producer of the Mike Douglas show, which was the big, 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 the first and only daytime talk show at that time. It was a humongously popular show, uh, 90 minutes every day. It had a bigger audience than Oprah by about 10 times. Um, and, um, and there was this young guy that had just taken it over as executive producer, and he'd seen some of my work and wanted to meet with me. His name was Roger Ailes. Okay, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and... Um, uh, and he was great. He was terrific. And, and he said, I'll, okay, if you come down and be the producer with me, I'll let you do all the film work that you want to do, as long as we get our 90 minutes a day live done every week. <laughs> you, know, you can do all the film you want on the side. So I, I took the gig and I was there for a year and a half working side by side with Roger, who was, uh, who was terrific and funny and witty and brilliant. I mean, you walk into a room with Roger, you immediately you knew you were not the smartest person in the room, uh, or maybe the most wily. Uh, but I have to say that um, his later escapades were just so hard to hear about. I never saw Roger hit on anybody except Richard Nixon, um, mm -hmm. who came to do the show in, uh, um, in 1968. And Roger convinced him to uh, let me be your media advisor and I'll get you elected. And actually, they asked me to leave. the. Du then I took over the Douglas show. I was 24, the executive producer, this national television show. Wow. And, uh, and I got a call one night that they said, Kenny, it's Roger and Dick. I said, Okay, Dick, and they wanted me to leave and come and be direct, be his television director, and do this big Madison Square Garden rally for them, and then go into the White House with them. I said, "Thank you very much, but no, uh, not my choice." Uh, and so I, uh, I was there for a couple of years, very successful, and I finally said, "Okay, I'm done with television. I'm going to go out to the West Coast and get my foot into the door." And I came out here, and uh, and Hollywood said, "Oh well," uh, I said, "I'm ready to make movies," and they said, "No, no, you're a talk show producer," you know, so. Uh, so it was the uh, the kid with the suitcase, the, you know, the briefcase, and then the talk show producer, and then um, the out of work writer. And I was uh, and and I was 
staying it with my pal Steve Bochco, who had been a uh, classmate at Carnegie. And, um, and he said, you know, Kenny, uh, I can introduce you around. Uh, he had already, had already had his foot in the door at Universal, but he was still a fledgling writer then. This was before Hill Street Blues, even his first hit. Um, and he said, but you know, if you write, you really can, can have a way to get in easier. And I said, I don't like writing. Writing is hard. You know, directing is easy, man. Uh, he said, yeah, you can do it. And, and so he, he just dragged me kicking and screaming to writing. And I became a great writer of unproduced screenplays. Uh, but he also introduced me to um, his pal, Steve Cannell, who was also a young writer at Universal at the time, who was just sort of getting his uh, feet under him. Um, and the two of them really helped to engineer getting me some a couple of gigs inside uh, Universal. And one of the spec scripts that I wrote, uh, Harv, uh, Steve gave to a guy named Harv Bennett, who was a big executive producer. He did Rich Man, Poor Man, a lot of big miniseries in those days. And he was doing a show called The Six Million Dollar Man. Mm -hmm. And they were desperate for new scripts and, because they were in their first full season and, uh, uh, and really hungry for scripts. And, uh, and Harv read the feature script that I'd written, liked it. He said, I can't get this produced for you, but I like the writing. Uh, bring me some ideas. So I was sitting in his office and I said, well, what, why don't we do The Bride of Frankenstein? And he said, well, I said, well, you got this weird guy with these weird parts. I mean, shouldn't, he, shouldn't there be a mate? Shouldn't there be a bionic woman? And Harv said, we like that idea. You want to write it? <laughs> and I said, sure. <laughs> you know. Why not? And, uh, you know, and so it was, uh, so I, I, uh, I wrote it, wrote the script. It was a one hour episode. Uh, and it was, I, I kept saying, Harv, there's too much stuff in it. It's too this, uh, you know. And he said, you and you know, we agree. I read it. Freddie Silverman, who was head of ABC, read it. He said, we love this script. We love this character. But it's, it's too dense. And I said, what do you want to lose? You know, let's take out some of the run and jump stuff and make it more personal. I said, no, we don't want to make it shorter. We want you to make it longer. And I said, what do you mean? He said, I said, you've only got a one hour show. So yeah, well, it's going to be a two-parter. Nobody had ever done, I don't think, a two-parter of a one hour episodic show at that point. And I said, do I get paid for another script? <laughs> and he said, yes, you do. I like that idea. So um, uh, I went back and, uh, and made it the way that I had wanted to make it from the beginning. Uh, and the bionic woman uh, went on the air with a lot of press. I helped Harv go through the casting and do the casting and everything. He really sort of took me under his wing and, 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 and while we were doing it and asked me if I would come and join him as a producer writer on Six Million Dollar Man. And I said, I, you know, producing sort of a pain in the ass, Harv. Let me just write and direct for you. That's what I want to do, really. Uh, but he said, Kenny, let me explain how television works. He said that in television, the producer is the guy who hires the writer and who hires the director. I said, okay, I'll take that job. <laughs> you know? And I did, and then proceeded to hire myself to write, and, uh, and when I could, direct. Uh, because when you're doing a one-hour episodic show, it's like living in a garbage disposal. Uh, it's, uh, it's an unbelievable crunch. And then uh, because the bionic woman was so astonishingly successful uh, on Six Mill, even though she died at the end, which I did not want to do, but they wanted to do love stories, so we need to kill her off. <laughs> This is a mistake, so I killed her off, and um, and they got mountains of mail from all over the country. My my favorite came from the head of the psychology department at Boston University, who said, "How dare you create this brilliant female archetype, this role model for young women, and just toss her away? What are you crazy?" And so they were looking at the letters, but they also were looking at the ratings because it had really boosted six mil up, you know, way high. So uh, they said. Yeah, I'll bring her back. Let's bring her back, Kenny. Why'd you kill her anyway? That was a stupid idea. Uh, and, was uh, so, yeah, so I uh, so I brought her back, and um, uh, and that was in the time when at the end of the summer that you'd be doing reruns, and the last two reruns of the summer were the Bionic Woman on the Six Million Dollar Man. And tune in next week for the return of the Bionic Woman. And everybody in America tuned in. The yeah. Six Million Dollar Man went into the top ten for the first time, and we were on opposite. All in the Family, which was also in the top 10. It was a huge audience, and, uh, and the audience loved it, and loved that Lindsay was back, and, um, uh, and, and Freddie Silverman immediately wanted to spin it off into its own series. 
And if you think that doing one episodic show is like working in a garbage disposal, you ought to try doing two at the same time when you're writing and producing two one hour episodic television shows. The way I, you know, when somebody makes a movie, they've got nine months to a year to make two hours of film. Mm -hmm. You're doing a television show like that, you had to make 22 hours of film in the same nine months. Yeah. And it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. It's, it's amazing how good everything came out. <laughs> Yeah, it really is. It really is. And, and that it, yeah, that it uh, I mean, listen, uh, every episode is not brilliant, but we really worked hard and we really tried. And I was really determined to try to bring that humor and that heart uh, and to mine all the characteristics that Lindsay had inherently as a person and as an actress. Um, and um, and she, uh, we still have lunch every uh, couple of times a year. And, and we were talking last time about uh, how lucky we were and what we had accomplished uh, for so many people. And uh, it's interesting, I get a lot nowadays, a lot of mail from LGBTQ people mm -hmm. talk about how they all focused on the bionic woman because she looked like one thing on the outside, but she was something else on the inside. Yeah. And I thought, yeah. wow, never thought of it that way, but it's, it's true. And again, it's uh, breaking through stereotypes and all that, so it's good stuff. Anyway, what else can we get to before we, I have to ring off here? Uh, let's see. How about um, uh, talk about a uh, uh, Incredible Hulk for a minute, for a couple minutes. Sure. And, uh, uh, the Bionic Hulk. Woman had been very had been very successful, <clears throat> and um, suddenly I was sort of the one of the golden boys at Universal, and Cannell had created the Rockford Files by then, and Bochco was moving on too. So we were all sort of moving up the ladder fast. Uh, and uh, Frank Price, who was head of Universal, asked me. Uh, he said, "We've just acquired the rights to five of the Marvel Comics superheroes." which he, just a few years, just last December, we had a little reunion thing. And he said, you know how much that cost me, Kenny? Buying those five titles? $15,000. I said, what? You, you got the rights to, they had Captain America, uh, Ms. Marvel, which I guess was Captain Marvel later, um, uh, the Man from Atlantis, the Human Torch, and the Incredible Hulk. And, uh, and Frank said, I'd like you to do one of these, we're going to do two two-hour two movies, and then it'll become a series. And I said, no thanks, Frank. Uh, I don't get into spandex and primary colors, except in my private time. <laughs> you know, so uh, uh, not something I really want to do. And, uh, uh, but uh, he said, well, just think about it, think about it. And I, I was at home um, thinking about it. And Susie, my wife, uh, is the one that made it happen. Susie had given me a, a novel to read that I was in the middle of reading, and that was Les Miserables. So I, in my head, in my hands, I had had this story of a fugitive, a guy who was on the run, who's being pursued by Inspector Javert, you know? And, and I thought, oh God, there's a way to take a little bit of Victor Hugo and maybe borrow a little from Robert Louis Stevenson's Jekyll and Hyde, and this ludicrous thing called The Incredible Hulk, and turn it into a psychological adult drama, not a comic book show. And I went back to Frank and I said, all right, I'll do it for you if I can do it this way. And, uh, and if you like my concept, everybody will leave me alone and just let me do it. Let me cast it. Don't shove some actor down my throat that is not the right guy or just because you've got a deal with them. Mm -hmm. um, okay, Ken, sounds good. I said, oh, there's something else, Bernie. I want something in return. And maybe you've heard this story. He said, what, would you, what are you talking about? I said, well, I'd like to do something in return that's different, that's classy, that's classic, that's big. I would like to do a miniseries based on Sir Walter Scott's Ivanhoe. I said, this is a great uh, Victorian novel that has never been done right. And, uh, and it's swashbuckling and, it's, and there's great female characters in it and there's action and adventure. Yeah, yeah. Sounds good, Ken. Do the Incredible Hulk, and I'll do Ivanhoe. Four hours. Shake hands. And uh, so I wrote the Incredible Hulk pilot in seven days, Simon, top to bottom. We shot the white pages of my first draft, uh, and you know, no changes. Um, and uh, I just wanted to get it behind me so I could get onto Ivanhoe. Right? Yeah, definitely. But uh, the Hulk became this. Uh, I sent it to the. the I had seen Bill Bixby do a, uh, a play on PBS called uh, Steam Bath. Mm -hmm. You can get it on Netflix. Um, it's about this group of people uh, who are, wake up, find themselves in a steam bath, and none of them can quite remember how they got there. Um, I don't know if you've seen it. Have you ever seen yeah. it? Yeah, I saw it. Yeah. Uh, and, but I was just, this was 1973, and I remember seeing it, and I, it, Bill's performance just blew me away. 
And as I was writing a Hulk uh, in 77, I thought, who do I owe? I know who I want. I want Bix. And I met him once just casually, but, but uh, we, the, his agent sent him the script and, and Bill said, I'm not going to read anything. It's called the Hulk. And his agent said, yes, you are. <laughs> and uh, he read it and he called me the next day. Can I come see you? And I said, well, oh, sure, Bix, come on over. And he came in and Bill always came into a room like, Broom, you know, <clears throat> filled up the room. What a huge personality he had. Yeah. And uh, he said, is this really what we're going to do? Are we going to suffer? Am I going to suffer? Is it going to work? Drama, angst. Yeah. He said, it's Greek, you know, it's Greek tragedy. He brings it down on himself. He said, right, yeah, that's, what, that's how I was trained, Greek tragedy. That's right. The, uh, the protagonist messes with, th messes with things better left to the gods, and the gods don't like it, and they come to get you. <laughs> and, um, uh, and so he was on board, and, uh, and it just all came together. And... Uh, um, and suddenly we were doing a series and, and the movie was released, as I said, as a foreign theatrical, made lots of money for overseas for, for Universal. Um, and, um, and, and, and the, the first meeting, Bill made me promise that I would, that I would stay with the show as long as he was. And I, I remember hearing the strains of Faust playing in the background. I'm wondering, <laughs> my Faustian bargain here? Do but I said no. You're a bit, Bill. That's fair. And we shook hands on it, and uh, and we were great pals uh, through the rest till the end of his life. Yeah, yeah. Again, you know that that's what made those shows work was the humanity. You know, you, you can never go wrong with Greek mythology. It's been used in <laughs> everything, it, and it still works to this day. Right. It's and, true. Uh, it, it's what makes everything so good. It, just brings everything home to people watching it. It brings everything so right. more realistic to life. Well, yeah, and I think the, I think the Hulk was lightning in a bottle because it really, I mean, there was a, I had a, a card at the beginning of it that something said something like, and off times, and within everyone, off times dwells a mighty and raging fury. Yeah. And everybody's felt that, Simon. You know, everybody's felt that, and the hulking out, it became called, right? Um, and uh, and I think that's partly there was that visceral connection to that sort of anger exploding, and it and what we when we did the shows we tried to think of different ways that people could manifest that kind of Hulkness inside them. With some people, with Bixby, it was anger with his character. With somebody else, it might be obsession, or it might be greed, or it might be jealousy, or <clears throat> and so we would uh, we would try to. Uh, write as thematically as we could, you know, when we were when we were doing things like that. But uh, how did um, uh, Ferrigno, how did Ferrigno get involved to play the Hulk? Was that your choice or? Uh, well, I I had originally cast um, uh, Richard Keel okay. uh, in the role because I wanted I wanted an I wanted an actor. You know, I was mm -hmm. fearful of I had, I met Lou. Um, we talked about Schwarzenegger, but he was busy doing Conan, and also he's only like five foot ten and. <clears throat> you know, I knew somebody. And actually, I think it was uh, it was Arnold who suggested we check out Lou. And um, uh, and Louis came in and, and read for me, and, and he was a very sweet guy, but he'd never done any acting at all. Uh, and certainly he was built huge and all, but uh, uh, but I really felt that I needed an actor. So we started with Richard Keel, but about a week into the filming, we all just felt, it just doesn't feel right. We need to have a big muscle guy. And I went back and sat down with Louie and we tried to, and since he didn't have any lines, we could, I couldn't read with him or anything. We just had to sort of improvise things and, and, until I could feel like I could really get a performance out of him. And then ultimately I did. So it, uh, uh, it, felt, it felt encouraging to me that we could, we could move forward. And, uh, and Louie grew into the role and bless his heart, uh, we're still great pals today. And, uh, uh, and he's done some wonderful things for, uh, he works with the Sheriff's Department and yeah. a great uh, uh, inspirational seeker, speaker for kids who have disabilities like he has, because he's totally deaf, as you know. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and um, uh, and it's, it's, uh, so it was, it, was, it was a good thing. But uh, before we go, I should say that uh, if anybody has questions or comments, you know, they can always uh, email me through my website, which is just uh, kennethjohnson.us. And, uh, uh, you know, so if anybody uh, listening wants to know more about something, they can always write me there. I will write you back. Maybe not immediately, but I will. And, okay. uh, uh, and have, I'd be happy to hear from you. Okay. So before we let you go, we, we always want to ask two questions to those who uh, we, we've talked to. Mm -hmm. uh, first question is, any advice for those trying to break into the movie industry or entertainment industry? Sure. Uh, I think you have, to, you have to follow your bliss. If it's, if it's something that you are 
<laughs> you know what I say to my film students? I, I do a filmmaking seminar that started at UCLA and then I've done it at USC and at uh, uh, all of the, the, the venues in California as well as the English National Film School and the University of Moscow. Um, and one of the things that I always, the first things I ask the students when they are there for the first time, I say, do you love this business? And they go, oh yeah, yeah. I say, no, you're not hearing me. Do you love this business? Do you love this business like you're not able to breathe unless you're doing it, like you're underwater unless you're doing it? If you love it that much, then you have a chance of being successful. But if you don't, don't do it to yourself. It's too much heartbreak, there's too much rejection, and you won't survive because there are people behind you that do love it that much and that will hang on till the very end. And listen, I have had plenty of downs in uh, between my ups in this business, probably more downs than ups, um, but I love it so much, there's nothing else I would rather do. And I, that's how much I love it. And you have to love it that much so that you can completely put your heart into what you're doing. Yeah, I completely agree. The second question, uh, we, we already talked about V, the movie. Is there any other projects that you have working on that you're able to talk speak about? That's the, that's the that's the main thing that we're we're focused on right now. Um, there, I do I do have had a couple of uh, successful novels lately. One of them, uh, The Man of Legends, uh, actually became a, a big bestseller on Amazon, and uh, uh, so we're talking about how to do that. It's a big <laughs> a big story that's very expensive and sort of travels the world over 2,000 years. Um, and uh, The Man of Legends is a, it's a, it's a pretty good novel and it got some really nice notices and, and the reader reviews have just been phenomenal. It's uh, on the Amazon site. I think it has a 4.3 out of 5 stars with about over 4,000 reader reviews where people have said, this is really cool. Uh, and there's a lot of actually Hulkness in it. Uh, because again, it's about a hero that has brought down a curse upon himself, wherein he cannot die. And he cannot stay in the same place for more than three days <clears throat> and cannot go backwards. <laughs> so he's been on this forced quest uh, for the last 2000 years. And a bit like Forrest Gump, uh, he has been at many, many, many pivotal moments in history, which he actually shaped by having been there. Hmm. Uh, I mean, Forrest Gump shaped events in the 20th century. My guy has shaped events over 20 centuries. So it's a big piece, but uh, it's also a very personal and heartfelt uh, love story. Uh, and so we're endeavoring to try to put that together as maybe a limited series or something like that. We'll see where it goes. But yeah, I, haven't, I, haven't, I, haven't read that. I haven't read it yet. I've seen it. I've been wanting to get it. Well, I've been, there you um... go. There's no excuse now. You know? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I've been, I've been finishing up... Um... Uh, the Game of Thrones books and um, uh, the Song of Fire and Ice. I mean, those are like 1400 pages or more each. And so it, right. I'm, I'm nearing the end of the final book, but I'm eager to read, um, <laughs> okay. read, read that. Well, let, me know, let me know what you think when you read it. And, um, uh, and it's been a pleasure talking to yeah. you. Uh, Simon, and uh, give my regards to Paul. I will. We would uh, love to talk to you again about uh, your other projects that you've done, the feature films that you've done. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, so we can uh, maybe arrange a time for that as well later okay, on. Okay, we'll come back. We'll come back to that later on because there's some, there's some fun stories among the Disney Channel movies that I've yeah. done as well as uh, Short Circuit 2. We're about to do a new Blu-ray release of that, which okay. I'm putting together uh, information for, for a director commentary. And, uh, and I've got director commentaries on practically all the DVDs, as you probably know. Yep. Yeah. Okay, but, well. Uh, but, it was great talking to you, and uh, I know you got to go, so have a great uh, afternoon, have a great evening, and uh, say hello to everyone, your family, and everyone uh, out there. <laughs> I will, Simon. Thank you so much, and give my regards to Paul, and uh, stay well yourself, okay? Will do. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Bye.